is it currently 8 30 it's a.m in lisbon what up and i am here with p of course let me show you her and we are both trying to get over jet lag right now which is way harder than it seems but hey getting up by 7 30 8 o'clock is pretty good so we're winning <laughs> <laughs> Yo, I don't know how it happened, but I freaking traveled with my puppy to Portugal. I know, baby girl. I know. But we traveled to Portugal. We traveled from the US to freaking Europe. Last year, I had this crazy wild idea that I wanted to travel internationally with my dog. And honestly, even since the first moment I got key, which was like six years ago at this point, I knew that she was going to be an international dog. And now she finally is. <laughs> And it's just so funny because everyone told me that getting a dog was gonna hold me back. They were like, your life is over. You won't be able to travel anymore. But honestly, I just completely refuse to subscribe to that narrative. <laughs> and literally everyone who told me that had never had a dog themselves. So just a reminder not to listen to people who are telling you negative things, especially if they haven't done it themselves. I hear this all the time. For example, with real estate investing, everyone's like, it's so risky. And then that person hasn't actually like invested in real estate themselves. Don't listen to them. <laughs> now, the funny thing is, is that I I've actually been planning on coming to Portugal for a while now, but I really didn't dig into the details until about a month before I left. And I told everyone I was coming and I was bringing my dog, but I really didn't know 100% if it was gonna be feasible or not until I really started digging into the details. But at least based off of my preliminary research, it seemed pretty feasible. So I was like, I think I'm gonna be fine. And really, you never know until you do the actual research yourself. So once again, stop listening to folks who are like, you can't do this and you can't do that. You don't actually take the time to do the research yourself. You're never really gonna know. But now I have officially gone through the whole process. We're literally sitting here in our little Airbnb in Porto in Portugal. And basically I'm here to show you how the heck I did it. So this is truly gonna be a step-by-step -step how to get your dog to Europe, specifically to Portugal, since that's the only one I've actually had experience doing. Some of the other countries are gonna have slightly different rules. So make sure you actually do your own research to ensure that you can actually get your dog into the country that you're trying to go to without any complications. And just one other thing is I came from the US. So this is specifically US travel to Portugal. The US is not considered a high risk rabies country. So if you are coming from a high risk rabies countries, I know you're gonna have a whole lot of other things that you're actually gonna do in order to bring your dog into the country. And none of that's gonna be covered in this video because I didn't actually have to do any of that. But I will leave the link so that you can go in and do the research for yourself and for your specific case. Also, this video is extensive enough as is, so we don't need to add all that extra info. <laughs> now, you may have noticed that I have a completely different background right now. And yes, I did actually move apartments here in Porto. The first Airbnb I ended up staying at just like really wasn't an awesome experience, but I am so happy with my new place and I am gonna give you guys a full tour of it, so do not worry about that. But if you also want me to do a story time video about what what happened with my last Airbnb, let me know in the comments and I will make a video for you. Also, I highly recommend that you watch this entire video, save it for later for whenever you are ready to bring your pet to Europe because it's gonna be super, super, super helpful. And there are just like so many good little nuggets in there. Okay, so to get your dog into Portugal, the number one first thing that you're gonna do is to pull up the USDA website. That's the US Department of Agriculture that specifically talks about pet travel. This website is literally your bloodline. So keep it saved or tab, put it in your notes somewhere where you can find it because you're literally gonna be going back to this website like a hundred times. <laughs> okay, y'all, I swear you're gonna see me in so many different outfits, but that's okay. This video is really extensive and has taken me multiple tries to actually put together because there's so much information. But so the first thing that you're gonna go do is actually come here to the US Department of Agriculture website. Now you're gonna click on the website and then you're gonna scroll down to taking a pet from the US to another country, export. So once you've clicked that, it'll take you to this next webpage and all you really need to know is if you scroll down and of course, obviously go through, read the page, 
But what you really gonna want, are gonna want to do is come to the select country. So for this example, obviously I'm gonna be using Portugal since I travel Portugal. So we'll scroll down and go to Portugal, which is here. Click view requirements. And then it's basically gonna outline all of your requirements that you need. Now it's not super straightforward, which is why I'm making this video to kind of break it out because it's a lot of information to take in. But we're not looking at pet birds. We're not looking at other pets. We're specifically looking at pet dogs, which is the easiest thing to transport out of all of these. And then we'll go through every single thing, what the different criterias are and full steps on how to do it. And then the next thing that you're gonna have to do is find an accredited veterinarian or a military veterinarian if you're in the military. But for the purposes of this video, I'm gonna assume that you're not in the military and you're just a regular person like me. So you don't necessarily have access to a military veterinarian. Now the key here is to find an accredited veterinarian that has experience with pet travel to Europe. So basically what I did is I ended up calling a bunch of different vets around Colorado because that's where I was at the time just to make sure that they were actually accredited and could do pet travel documents because obviously you don't want to waste anyone's time or your own time for that matter. <laughs> but so now you're really, really going to be depending on them to get the job done right. Something that I didn't do, but I would really highly recommend that you do is ask them how many times they've actually filled out the EU documents to send pets over to Europe, because that will kind of let you know how comfortable they really are with the documentation. And make sure to go see your vet at least one to two months before you travel, because there's specific deadlines throughout this whole process. It's gonna be really critical to make sure that you actually make those deadlines. Okay, so now let's get into the nitty gritty, literally step-by-step, -step, everything that you need to do in order to get your dog to Europe. And my dog is literally just chilling on the bed over there, having a grand old time. <laughs> Must be nice. <laughs> the first thing that you're gonna need to make sure that you do is check with your vet to make sure that your dog has an ISO compliant microchip. So if your dog came from an accredited shelter like Kiana came, a lot of the time they'll actually put in an ISO microchip from the get-go. And nowadays it's pretty much the standard microchip. ISO microchips are 15 digits long and meet international standards. Now, the way to actually check to make sure that your dog does have an ISO specific microchip is you gotta go to an accredited veterinarian and they will scan it for you. And make sure they write down the number of this microchip and the date that they scanned it because you're gonna need that for later. Now, if you don't have a microchip, that is gonna be your next step. You need to get your vet to implant an ISO microchip. There's literally no way around this. <laughs> but let's say your pet does already have a microchip. It's just not ISO compliant. Then you can either travel with your own scanner or you can just get your vet to implant a new one. And I would really suggest just implanting a new one. You don't want to get to Europe and then, then be like, sorry, this isn't compliant. If your dog does already have a microchip and you implant a new one, just make sure that the two are compatible and aren't going to cause any issues with your pet. And also make sure that both of the microchips are actually listed on your health certificate, which we'll go over soon. Okay, the second super critical thing that you're gonna make sure that you get checked is making sure that your pet's rabies vaccinations are up to date and that their first rabies vaccination, also known as their primary rabies vaccination, happened after the microchip implant. So if you got your dog years ago, like I did, you're basically gonna have to track down all of that information. Like literally I've had Kiana for almost six years now <laughs> and we've lived all over the place from New Orleans to Colorado. We've gone to vets in Houston. We've gone to vets in Virginia. <laughs> So you can only imagine how fun it was to actually track down all of that information. But here are some key things about the rabies vaccination that you need to know. The primary rabies vaccination is only valid for one year. A lot of places provide three year rabies vaccinations. If your pet's primary one was a three year vaccination and you didn't get another vaccine before the year mark, that doesn't count. And that actually means that your coverage lapsed. And so now the next vaccination is actually gonna be your primary rabies vaccination. And then after that, if your pet gets another vaccination within one year, that is considered your booster rabies vaccination. And it is totally fine for your booster to be one to three years. 
However, if you do wait over a year and you do wait between the one to three years, then you gotta make sure that you provide information about that primary vaccination. So you'd have to provide records of all your vaccination documents just to show that there is no lapse in those rabies vaccinations. But honestly, instead of tracking all that information down, I would just go ahead and give your pet another vaccination that becomes your new primary. That way you don't have to actually go back and track all of those documents. Remember, however, that you must get your vet vaccinated for rabies after they actually implant the microchip. So if you're getting a new microchip, you gotta wait until after the microchip is in there before giving them the rabies vaccination. Another thing is make sure you actually include your microchip number on all of your rabies vaccination certificate. It just makes it easier for whoever is gonna be reviewing those documents. Also, if you did have to get a new rabies vaccination, you do have to wait 21 days before actually entering into the EU. So that's why I say make sure to go to your vet between one to two months before you have to travel. That way, if you have to get a new booster shot, you've still got a very healthy 21 day period before they're actually allowed into the EU. Also, just to really fully simplify everything, the website actually just recommends you do this. It says, ask your veterinarian to give your pet a one-year rabies vaccination after scanning the microchip at least 21 days before your travel to the EU, but less than one year before your travel date. For example, three to six months before travel date. That way, no matter the rabies vaccination history, you only have to keep up with one vaccination certificate instead of several. Yo, this video is um, extensive. <laughs> so if you like this video, I'd really appreciate it if you just hit that like and especially the subscribe button. I'm really trying to get to a thousand followers by my birthday, which is in October and I'm at like 780 subscribers or something like that. And I'm so close. So I am really trying as hard as I can to put as much valuable content out there for y'all. And all I ask in return is you like, you subscribe, you share this with a friend, you know. <laughs> now you've gotten the microchip scanned, you've gotten all your rabies certification filled out, completed on our way. The next critical thing that you're gonna need to do is fill out your EU health certificate. Hi Kiki, you wanna come up? Come here. Well, okay. So that you can bring your puppy to up. <laughs> Kiki, you wanna look at the camera? No. Here, we're gonna turn. Now you can. Look at that. <laughs> okay, so your accredited veterinarian is gonna have to fill out that EU health certificate. Either they can print it out for you or you can go to the website, you know that USDA website that I was telling you before that you must have bookmarked, you can get it from there as well. There is one page that you are gonna actually have to fill out, but most of it's honestly gonna be your vet. And this process can either be super smooth sailing and no problem, right? Or it can be incredibly painful and tedious. It really just depends on the vet that you choose. And this is why I say at the very beginning that it is important to double check and make sure that your vet actually has experience filling out these forms, especially the EU specific one. So maybe they've done ones to Australia or other countries. I mean, it's specifically the European Union. They gotta be going to Europe. <laughs> so make sure whenever you're vetting out your vet that they have experience actually doing that. And honestly, nothing against the ones who don't have any experience. I just think for you, for this specific case, you're not gonna wanna be sitting at the vet for like three hours like I was and then having to come back multiple times because it was filled out wrong. <laughs> and they didn't really know what they were doing, but that's okay. I really like them, they're great vet, just not specifically for this particular task. <laughs> and there are two different kinds of UEU health certificates, so make sure you actually pick the right one. <laughs> If you're traveling with your dog casually, then you're probably just gonna need the non-commercial EU health certificate. There is another version that's the commercial one, but that's for if you're bringing like over six dogs with you or you're not coming at the same time, it's a whole thing. So for the purposes of this video, you're probably a regular person like me and you're just gonna need the non-commercial health certificate. Now, super critical, this document is only valid for up to 30 days. So this is where you don't want your vet to fill this in too early, like over a month before traveling, because it's gonna be void by the time that you travel. So make sure that you're actually going to the vet. I believe I went like two weeks before traveling, two and a half weeks, got everything filled out and signed. That way I knew it was gonna be valid when I was traveling to Europe. You may also wanna consider getting doggy Xanax or anti 
anxiety medication for your dog just because being on a plane is really weird for them a lot of the times even if they are pretty good on flights like kiana is pretty good on flights it's going to be a lot more comfortable for them and for you if they just have some sort of anti-anxiety medication and your vet should be able to prescribe that to you no problem the fourth unbelievably critical step of getting your dog to europe is making sure that you get the USDA to actually endorse your EU health certificate. The super critical thing here is that the USDA can only endorse your EU health certificate up to 10 days before you actually arrive in your location in Europe. And remember, it's not actually 10 days from you leaving the US, it's from your arrival in Portugal. <laughs> So for a lot of people, I know this was the case for me. I had a red eye, so a flight that actually went overnight, meaning that the day I was arriving was a day later than the day that I was leaving, meaning that I had to make sure that I was counting it back from the day that I was arriving and now that I was leaving, you know? Hope you got that. <laughs> now you're gonna wanna overnight the health certificate to the closest USDA office to you, ideally, or the closest one to wherever you're leaving the US from. Cause you really are gonna want those papers in hand at least within like four to five days of you leaving just to make sure that everything is good. Here are a few things that you have to include within your mailing packet to the USDA office. You need a self-addressed prepaid express return shipping label. That was really hard to say. <laughs> the USDA is actually gonna be using that label to send the package back to you but on that label you need to make sure to put your name and address on both the to and the from and this is for that return label that way if it gets lost for whatever reason it's still just going to be sent back to you if, instead of back to the usda office and it has to be prepaid and it has to have a tracking number too that way you can track it and make sure that it's on its way and going to arrive to you in time now when i called the usda office they told me not to do ups ground so don't do ups ground for whatever reason they just said no i'm guessing they've had issues in the past also, if you need to include an envelope size, you don't actually have to include a return envelope. They have envelopes at the office. But if you need to include the envelope size on the return label, they tell you to just use 12.5 by 9.5 inches, I think, <laughs> and one pound for the weight. You may want to double check that. <laughs> But so in the actual package, you're gonna make sure to include the original documents for that EU health certificate that your vet has already filled out, signed, stamped, and you filled out that last page in the health certificate. Make sure to include any of your vaccination certificates as well. And then for some countries, they also might need additional test results or laboratory tests. For Portugal, they didn't actually need it, but depending on where you might be going in Europe or anywhere, you might have some additional things to do. And also some countries do require an import permit. Once again, Portugal didn't need that, so I didn't have to worry about that, thank goodness. And then they also require you to add the pet owner's checklist. It's actually like the pet owner's checklist. I'm gonna read it. The pet owner's checklist for shipping health certificates to a USDA endorsement office. Yes, I do have a script so I don't forget what I'm saying to you guys. But you're gonna need to make sure you fill out that checklist and include that in your package as well. And then it also allows for them to call your vet if they need to, because you put their contact information on there. Like this is what happened with me. My vet didn't actually fill out my form completely correctly. So they had to call them, make sure that they were able to fax or scan over any additional documents, whatever. And then also the credit card information sheet that they provide is super important. I'm going to be including links to all of these in the description, but you want to make sure that that's filled out so that you can actually make a payment for getting it endorsed, which you need to do so that you get your documents back. Okay, step number five is determining whether your dog is going to be able to go in cabin or hold. So traveling in the cabin is when your dog actually comes with you on the plane, sits at your feet or in a carrier under the seat. And then traveling in hold or by cargo is when you get a crate, you put your dog in the crate and they travel under the plane separately from you. Now, obviously most people are going to want to travel with their pet if they possibly can. Different airlines are going to have different requirements to be certain that your airline will allow you to travel with a dog. I traveled American Airlines, didn't have any issues. It was a very, very smooth process. But basically you can find the requirements for any airline by typing in airline, whichever airline it is, pet travel in Google. <laughs> and they usually have a whole page that talks about pet travel and how to travel with your dog. Like I said, I travel to American Airlines, so I can go ahead and include that link so you guys can refer to that if you plan on traveling American Airlines as well. But the, really the first thing that's gonna determine if your pet can actually travel 
in the plane with you or if they have to travel by cargo is going to be their size. Your pet usually has to be less than 8 kilograms, about 20 pounds. Some airlines have a strict weight limit. For others, it may be more determined on the actual size of the carrier that you're going to put them in. So for example, American Airlines doesn't have a weight limit. They just say that, yeah, your carrier has to be a certain size and fit under your seat. And once again, this is something I did not memorize. So I'm gonna read this off the computer screen right now. So American Airlines says that if it's a hard-sided kennel, it has to be 19 by 13 by 19 inches. And then if it's a soft-sided kennel, it has to be 18 by 11 by 11 inches. And they usually recommend a soft-sided kennel. But basically, they just have to be small enough to actually fit inside the kennel, and the kennel has to be able to fit under the seat while it's closed. If you're gonna go this route, you do have to pay an additional $125 per trip, basically, to travel with your pet. So if you're buying a one-way ticket, you pay $125. If it's there and back, you're gonna pay $250. See, meh. Now, if your pet is larger than that, then they will have to be checked. For American Airlines, they don't actually allow regular checked pets. So you're gonna have to go with a different airline if your dog is too big and you wanna travel with them to Europe. They only allow it for US military and like US state for department type of situation. I don't even know exactly what that is. <laughs> so if you have a larger pet, it may not be the best idea to go with American Airlines, but there are a lot of other airlines that will allow you to travel with a larger pet. Now they even have pet charter flights. However, just know, these pet charter flights are not cheap. It's like, I think I've seen as high as 10, 13,000 for a flight. <laughs> and even though you do share these planes with other people traveling with pets, it is definitely not gonna be your cheapest option. There's a person I follow on Instagram. I will link them in my description once I go back and I'm not filming this and I can figure out what her name was. She has done that. And if you need more information about that type of stuff, you can follow her or ask her. I honestly haven't really done too much research on that front just because it wasn't really what I needed right now. <laughs> now, the last way to travel with your dog in the cabin is for them to be a service dog. Fully trained service dogs have no additional fee. And in order for them to be a trained service dog, they have to be able to perform some specific sort of toss. And that toss should relate to the person's disability, like visual impairments, deafness, seizures, PTSD, mobility impairments, neurological impairments. There's a large variety of things. With service dogs, you don't need to have them in a carrier either. They just need to be able to sit at your feet and lie at your feet and basically not close a ruckus. So quick plug here. I have just had this calling to help other folks basically do what I'm doing right now. I am here in Portugal with my dog. Come up, keep, come up. <laughs> As you can see, here in Portugal with my dog, the reason that I'm able to do all of this started with house hacking and with real estate investing. Basically, I want to help other folks do the same, break out of this idea that they have to climb the corporate ladder and be in corporate America and find other streams of income to free up their time to go do the thing that they always wanted to do. And so I'm coming out with a new course called the Wonderlust Wealth Academy. And y'all, I am so freaking excited and pumped for this. I don't even care if anyone signs up just because I know that there is so much value in there and someone is gonna find value in it. <laughs> but if you're interested in joining, you should sign up for the waitlist using this link because it's gonna be first available for folks on the waitlist and they're gonna get the best and the cheapest price that it's literally probably ever gonna be. <laughs> so yeah, sign up for the waitlist. Okay. Almost done with this video, let's go. <laughs> Step number six is going to be to notify the airline. So once you've got the approval from your vet, you've got the approval from the USDA, it's time to actually let the airline know. Now I would even do this before you get your USDA enforcement because sometimes it takes the airlines a few days to approve it and you wanna make sure you have them approved to be traveling with you at a minimum of 48 hours before getting on the plane. I would do it way earlier than that. You can do it as early as like a month whenever you can literally do it when you book your flight <laughs> if they're not a service dog you should just be able to go in either on your app or online and add that you're bringing a dog with you i would literally even go as far as to actually call the airline and just make sure that everything's squared away or contact them directly and be like it's good you got all the documents you got everything you needed i can bring my dog 
great. If they are a service dog, you are gonna have additional documents to fill out. You have the DOT service animal air transportation form. That form you fill out regardless of whether you're traveling internationally with your dog or if you're traveling domestically, you always have to fill out that form and send that to your airline. And like I said, you must submit it to them within 48 hours of traveling, but you can submit it as early as you want. So I would just recommend submitting it literally right away as soon as you book your flight. And in that document, you're gonna include information about where your dog was trained, about their vet, so that they have all of their contact information in case anything were to ever happen. And I will include a link to that form within the description. If the flight is over eight hours, you will have an additional form to fill out. And that's the DOT service animal relief attestation form. Basically just saying that your pet's not gonna, you know, pee or poop on the plane. <laughs> Another thing, you can get doggy diapers. I got one for Kiana, but she thankfully did not need to use it. <laughs> and I feel like she would have been really uncomfortable in a doggy diaper because I definitely didn't have the time to kind of get her used to it. But that is something that you can consider if your flight is over eight hours. Our flight was only six hours, really wasn't that bad. In case you didn't know, if you're going from New York or Philadelphia, it's literally a six hour flight to Portugal. It's awesome. But yes, really recommend letting your airline know at least a week beforehand. For American Airlines specifically, if you are bringing in a service animal, they're gonna review all of your docs and then give you a service animal ID. And you just need to make sure to put that ID number into your reservation. But if you are bringing in a service animal for American Airlines specifically, I'll include another link in the description for where you need to actually submit your forms. One big thing is if you do have a service animal, there's actually an even simpler way to do this is you can sign up for service dog pass. And what Service Dog Pass is it verifies that your dog is actually service animal trained so that whenever you travel in the future, you don't have to worry about submitting all of these forms every single time to your airline. You just have your Service Dog Pass and you can go smooth sailing and it's a lot nicer. <laughs> and this is the link for Service Dog Pass. Remember that if you are traveling with your dog in the cabin, you need to make sure that they are not growling, barking, peeing, attempting to bite or jump or lunge at anyone else. They have to be very well behaved. Otherwise you could be off to actually get off a flight or be banned or something. So yeah, if your dog is not well behaved, I would not recommend flying with your dog. <laughs> Okay, step number seven. This is where we're starting to really get exciting. You're like two days out from getting on the plane. Now you need to actually notify Portugal. I know that sounds super daunting. And when I read it, I was like, I gotta notify Portugal? <laughs> But yes, you need to notify the veterinary office basically in the Portuguese airport. And if you're traveling from a non-EU country, like I was traveling from the US, there are specific ports that you have to come in from. And this is specifically for Portugal. You can either come in from Lisbon, Porto, Faro, Funchal, Ponta Delgada, Terceira Island, or Beja. And you have to let them know that you're coming within 48 hours of arrival. Remember, arrival, not departure. 48 hours of arrival. Arrival. <laughs> and you're gonna send them your flight number, your time of arrival, the type of pet you're bringing in, and you're gonna forward all of your documents to them. So you're gonna need to scan every single one of your documents, like your EU health certificate, your rabies vaccination, and that EU health certificate has to be endorsed by the USDA. So this is once you've received it and you've gotten it back. And obviously make sure that your ISO microchip number is on your paperwork. You forward it all to them by email. And you also need to make sure that you get a response back from them. So I made sure to give them a call, send them an email, just so that I knew that they had received everything. Cause you don't want to get there and then be like, we never received anything. And you're like, well, crap. <laughs> Now, let me tell you, finding the contact information for the Portuguese veterinary department in the airport was a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> but thankfully, I was able to find it just hidden and buried between websites. And I've included a link for that in the description as well. That way you don't have to spend all of your time looking for it. They do charge 40 euros for a pet to come in. So you are going to have to pay that when you arrive. And then if you're bringing in two or more pets, it's 80 euros for two or more pets, which I thought was interesting. Now, the final step of getting your pet to Portugal or to Europe is to get on the flight, travel with your pet, and then when you arrive at the airport, it's actually going to the veterinary office at the airport. Make sure whenever you've contacted the veterinary office that you ask them where 
the vet office is just because it's going to be different in every single airport. For example, in Lisbon, it was at the checked baggage area. So I picked up my luggage and then Key and I, we went to the vet's office. Once you get there, they're going to scan your pet's microchip. They're going to check through all your documents. So make sure to bring your documents with you. Literally, that would be like the most terrible thing <laughs> would be to forget all the documentation. So bring that with you. <laughs> Once they've checked everything off, they're going to sign some paperwork for you. They're going to take out whenever you're leaving the airport. You just have to show the security folks that you went to the vet and got everything signed up. And then you literally walk out the airport and that's it. <laughs> Some really important things to keep in mind, though. If you are traveling with your dog, they do have to be at least 12 weeks old. Your pet also cannot be pregnant, which is very fair. And if you're doing a non-commercial, no more than five pets can come with you. I don't know why you'd be traveling with five pets, but hey, to each their own. <laughs> Sounds like a very stressful situation. Now, in Portugal specifically, there are unfortunately some breeds that are banned from coming into the country. Now, I obviously don't know those off by heart, so I'm going to read them out for you. We've got the Fila Brasileiro, the Doggo Argentino, the Pitbull Terrier, the Rottweiler, the American Staffordshire Terrier, the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and the Japanese Tosa. So if you do have one of those dogs, unfortunately, you won't be able to travel with them into Portugal. And I would assume that applies for a lot of other countries too. Oh, phew. Okay, that was a long video. <laughs> I had to film this in multiple different parts. But you guys really got the nitty gritty step by step of how in the heck to bring your dog to Europe with you. So just to recap, number one is you're going to need to make sure that they have an ISO compliant microchip. And if they don't, make sure you put one in. Number two is their rabies vaccination. That has to be completely up to date. You want to go back up to step two and it really goes into depth about everything there. Number three is getting that EU health certificate filled out by an accredited veterinarian. And then number four is getting that same EU health certificate endorsed by the USDA. Number five, determining if your dog is gonna travel in cabin or hold. And number six, once that has been determined, you gotta notify the airline and make sure to research the airline to ensure that your dog can actually come with you or make sure to buy a flight where your dog can come with you. Number seven, notify Portugal, specifically the vet's office at the Portuguese airport that you're going to or European airport you're going to. And number eight, get on the flight, board, arrive at your destination and go to the vet's office to get all of your document looked at, checked off, and you're in Europe suddenly. <laughs> that's it, folks. I hope you like this video. I am going to be putting out a part two to this video that's going to go over more so the day-to-day -day life here in Portugal and what it's like actually being in Europe with your dog or with your pet. Just because there are some nuances here that I think it'd be important for you to know, especially if you really, really are considering bringing your pet to Europe. And also, if you like this video, share this with someone who you think might find this information to be useful, is maybe thinking of traveling abroad with your pet. If you're thinking of traveling solo, you haven't actually done a solo trip before, you should really check out this video because in that video, I go over all of the common questions that I've gotten from some of my followers about solo travel, especially solo travel as a female. 